Hello and welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, this is where we explore the practical science of lasting well-being. And if you've listened to before, welcome back. I'm joined today, as usual, by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist and a best-selling author, and he's also my dad. So, Dad, how are you doing today? I'm good, and I can say most sincerely, always happy for us to be interacting with you. Yeah, it's always so great to do this, and I'm going to start today's episode with a little bit of flattery, not just for you, but for our listeners. We're incredibly lucky to have such an engaged and interested group of people who listen to the podcast. And because of that, we regularly get really interesting questions through email and on social media. So today we're going to be doing something that we haven't done for a long time and open up our mailbag. These are all questions that we received through either social media or email, as I said, and you can find our social accounts on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or by following the links in the description of today's episode on your podcast player. If you'd like to have a question answered on a future edition of the show, just send it in to contact at beingwellpodcast.com. And if you'd really like to get a question answered, you can join us on Patreon. I respond to pretty much every message we receive over there, and it's at patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. So these questions are going to cover a variety of topics, and they were all sent in by listeners, but I've removed identifying details, and occasionally I've kind of paraphrased or simplified what somebody said for a broader audience. So does that all sound good to you, Dad? Oh, yeah. I love the grab bags. It's great. And then there are portals, each one of these questions into deep and I think typically universal issues. Yeah, for sure. I'll go into our first question, which has to do with some family dynamic issues. And here it is. Over the last few years, I've seen my family less than normal due to COVID. I love my family, but we've got some chronic issues, probably like most families do. They do many things that I find difficult to be around, and there's some stuff from the past that I'd really like to process with them. Because of the pandemic, everyone's under a lot of stress. We've been seeing each other less, and when we do see each other, it feels like there's a lot of pressure to make the most of it and just be happy. It doesn't necessarily feel like the appropriate moment to have a big and potentially intense conversation with them. On the one hand, I don't want to be some kind of energy vampire, or get trapped in the past, or add stress to an already stressful situation. On the other, I don't want to just eternally sweep these issues under the rug, and I feel like they really are impacting our quality of life together. Do you have any advice? So, Dad, let's start with you. Oh, I have a long list, which I am going to try to cut down and make really, really short, (laughs) (laughs) practical and sweet. And, you know, as you know, the saying, right, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. I've had a lot of bad judgment about how to communicate in complicated, longstanding family type situations. Um, I came out of the culture, really, of the human potential movement where we just said everything to everyone all the time. And I kind of, I'm prepared to go there, but I've I've had to dial back from there. So a few, yeah, a few preliminary considerations. Uh, One question, of course, is do other people really want to process with you? And very often, as is somewhat implied, uh, they often don't. They don't really want to. So what do you do then? It's such a huge and common question. One thing is to ask yourself, what can I manage entirely internally about all this? In other words, can I alter my behavior a little bit, like disengage from certain relatives that just don't feel good to be around, spend more time with other people? Would it help to have some plausible rationales, which I confess to having created myself, whereby I've got to leave early or I need to have sit near a certain person or a certain window, who knows what, when everybody else is smoking cigarettes? Uh, you know, what can you handle internally? Also, psychologically, what can you just manage internally? You know, let's say they did some things, they were genuinely problematic. To what extent can you come to peace about that just inside yourself? Of whatever's left, do you have any allies? Are there any people like your sympathetic aunt or your cousin who just rolls their eyes along with you at what Uncle Bob starts ranting about? Do you have people that you could actually talk with who are not going to blab to other people? This is really important because 
as I've learned painfully, whatever you do in your families, you cannot undo. That toothpaste is out of the tube. You might be able to repair it or heal it, but it's done. And you also just have no idea about how other people are going to report or selectively summarize or nastily spin whatever it is that you say. Okay, so let's say now you've got the irreducible minimum upset. You just mm, have to really talk about it with somebody. Uh, Again, here too, you and I have explored this to a great extent, including in our chapter on courage in the book Resilient, which is a lot about interpersonal assertiveness. And I find that one of the best ways to do this is to really start with what John and Julie Gottman call a soft entry. Rather than coming in smoking hot, guns blazing, <laughs> instead, focus more on asking if it's possible to talk about something, inquiring how it's landed on other people, starting with how you may have wronged them, or you're wondering how you just landed on them. Maybe your intent was perfectly good or neutral, but your impact was problematic for them, and that led them to do what they do. I mean, coming into it in that way is going to increase your odds of um, a, big, a good result. Also, it helps to prevent other people from focusing on how you said it as a way to evade dealing with what you actually said. Uh, say that. And then the last thing I would just say is take the long view. You know, these are people probably who are going to come to your memorial or you're going to go to theirs. Uh, you're going to have a long-term relationship with them. And yeah, there's a place, as we've talked about in episodes on family estrangement for really just going, you know, I'm not getting anything out of that particular relationship, or maybe it's actively toxic and I'm going to draw a boundary there. But otherwise, uh, really take the long view, or, you know, and ask yourself if it's really, really worth it to try to push it, especially with people who are not used to talking about things uh, or just don't want to talk about it with you. Yeah. Yeah, you covered a ton there already. So I'm going to add only a couple of little things here. And the first thing that I just want to start by saying is that it sounds like the the questioner is taking a very thoughtful approach to this, just for starters. And I think that that's a good approach to take. You're weighing these different dynamics. You're balancing different needs of different people. And I do think that there's a place for being kind of respectful about what other people are going through. But you also don't want to let the immediate challenge of the moment get in the way of making a, a communication or having a conversation that could have very real long-term benefits, not just for your experience, but for the experience of the family as a whole. And I've talked often with my partner, Elizabeth, about how sometimes for one of us, there will be kind of a communication that's bubbling underneath the surface. We're sort of chewing on it. We're thinking about making it. But we just notice that the other person is, is going through a hard moment. And then, okay, so we kind of put it on the back burner and things get better and they're not going through the hard moment anymore. But then the things are better. And now you don't want to mess them up by having a <laughs> tricky conversation that maybe makes them worse again, right? So, <laughs> so you true. Can, absolutely. <laughs> you could just get into this kind of perpetual deferring yeah. of the hard conversation because there's kind of never a good time to have a, car, a hard conversation, right? When things are good, you don't want to mess with them. And when they're hard, you don't want to pile on. Um, and so I do think that that's a real, and I, I don't have a silver bullet for that. I'm not pretending to, but I do think that that's a real dynamic that a lot of people deal with in their lives and can be really challenging. Um, I think the main piece of advice that I would give just really dovetails with some of the things that you've already said, Dad, which is that there's a real wisdom in establishing the conditions that can lead to success in your communications. Uh, for instance, one piece of advice that we got from Stan Tatkin when he was on the podcast, and he's a, a great relationship counselor, is to basically never have an important or sensitive or touchy conversation while you're driving, particularly with your partner. You're distracted. It's a fundamentally threatening situation. Maybe all of this other dynamic stuff starts to enter the pie about like how somebody drives or how we only have these conversations when we're doing something else. You know, it's just, it's messy. So I think that there's a wisdom in avoiding messy situations. And maybe for you, a messy situation is during COVID. And so if this is one of those things where you feel like you can authentically kind of put in the bag for, 
you know, six to eight to 12 months here as plausibly conditions maybe improve a little bit. I, I think that that's a rational choice. Um, at the same time, as you were saying, Dad, if you feel like you can't do that, starting with a talk about talking, which we've talked about plenty on the podcast, uh, is I think a really good way to do it. I'd, having a, a, a process conversation with a member of your family that you feel relatively safe around. Hey, I've been chewing on this stuff. I'm not really sure how to bring it up. Do you have any advice? Do you have any thoughts? Do you think that that's something that people could be open to? It can just be a way to kind of like dot your I's and cross your T's and sort of set everybody for up for success in the future. Excellent. And Forrest, if you have anything you want to bring up with me, <laughs> not with the recorder on, my door is always open. Hey, we generally defer those conversations for when the recording isn't on. Maybe maybe one day we'll try to do one with the recording on and really go behind the curtain with it. But honestly, I, I feel pretty, uh, yeah, I feel pretty clean in my relationship with you right now, Dad. Ditto. So there's nothing I'm really stewing on. That's good. Okay. Uh, next question. I love this question. And uh, as with the previous one, we're going to try to kind of keep it moving. Each of these questions, which again, we're like so blessed by, is so deep that we could spend a whole episode talking about every one of them and all of the dynamics. But we're going to try to keep these to kind of five to 10 minutes each. So love this question because I'm honestly personally curious about it. Here it is. You talk about so many different kinds of therapy on the podcast acceptance and commitment therapy, internal family systems. You've talked about somatics, a bunch of behavior-based approaches, psychoanalytical stuff. But I've never actually heard Rick say what type of therapist he is. So what is he? What are you, Dad? I'm so messed up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's actually a school of therapy. I'm, there's an exact term for it that's escaping me. But basically it says uh, consciously eclectic. You know, in other words, kind of deliberately a grab bag therapy. And the best for therapy for the for a person is the one that has the best fit for who they are as a being. Dealing with this particular issue at this particular time in this particular way that's available to them. That's really, generally speaking, the best kind of therapy for myself. Briefly, I came up through the human potential movement. I think of myself as a garage band rock and roller who then in his 30s <laughs> went to Juilliard and learned really classical psychoanalytic uh, kind of music at the Wright Institute at Berkeley, wonderful place. Along the way, I was trained also in family systems approaches and I did a therapy myself with a Jungian, a wonderful Jungian um, analyst. And I learned a lot about Jung, who I respect immensely um, along the way. I've also been trained a lot in cognitive behavioral methods. And um, I have a near master's in developmental psychology. So to quickly summarize it, I tend to probably like a lot of therapists, think developmentally and dynamically and interact with my clients in interpersonally informed cognitive behavioral kinds of ways. Specifically, um, to finish, I find that a lot of what I focus on is resources, inner resources, which will probably surprise no one who knows anything about what I've written or has been listening to this podcast. In other words, first question, what is the challenge, especially as it's experienced internally? Maybe they're really afraid of public speaking, and that's becoming an issue in their work. Uh, maybe they're quietly melancholy and have been that way for their whole life, and they don't know what to do about it. So what's the challenge? Second, most important question, what, if it were more present in their mind, would really help? That's the money question. What would help if it were more present in their mind? Then the third question is, how can they have more experiences of that specific inner resource, which in the fourth question, how can they internalize those experiences as lasting neuroplastic change inside their own body? So I try to mobilize uh, you know, different kinds of psychological strengths, inner strengths in a client to deal with whatever issues they're dealing with. And along the way, if the person is open to it and has some feeling for it, to help them tap into the underlying uh, goodness, wakefulness, and lovingness that I think is inherent in all of us. 
to kind of put what you're saying there into to my limited understanding, because I am not a clinician, um, it sounds like you are all over the drawing map. a lot. That's what you're from a lot. For. Yeah, you're you're drawn <laughs> a lot from a lot of different places. But I think that this is actually consistent with most good therapists. Like mm-hmm. most of the good therapists that I've talked to, they have a core center of their methodology. They have a, a set of tools that they go back to over and over again. So maybe for you, that's that idea of resourcing. Yeah, like, where does it hurt? What would help? Yeah, yeah. Where does it hurt? What would help? How can we build more of that? Wham, bam, great. But, you know, different people come in with different problems, like you were saying in the very beginning, and maybe are suited by different kinds of methods. And you don't want to be somebody who only has a fastball as a pitcher. You want to have your curveball and your changeup and your whatever. And you go back to your fastball because it's like you're your priority pitch, but you can do the other ones too when you need to. Does now, that sound about right? Come on, Forrest, aren't you happy now that you're bringing in a sports metaphor? <laughs> Any opportunity I have on the podcast to display my fandom, is it's, it leaks out more and more as I've become a little bit more looser relaxed looser. as we're doing That's this. Good, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so to, to forward something I've already named Elizabeth once, I might as well keep doing it. Uh, Elizabeth is currently training my partner to be a psychologist, specifically a somatic psychologist. And I think that with somebody like you, Dad, because you're such a chameleon, everyone like sees in you what they want to see. So Elizabeth's theory for a number of years now has been that you're actually kind of sneakily a somatic psychologist. You just don't talk about it that way. Because you always go to like, oh, what does it feel like? And she's like, that's that's the game, right? I mean, that's what we're doing. So that's her theory. I'm sure if we talked to like an IFS person, they'd be like, I don't know, he does a lot of parts work or whatever uh, else. So yeah. <laughs> that's really sweet. Well, to underline that point too, um, the somatic therapies and that emphasis, which is very allied with my own background in human potential, which did have a lot of focus on intensity and embodiment. It's really, really important. And it's, it's interesting. I, I think maybe it's a bad metaphor, but it's, it's someone who's a alcoholic and stable recovery who often can really appreciate the virtues of sobriety. And for me, as someone who landed in adulthood, very Spock-like, kind of numb from the neck down, I really, really appreciate the value of somatic awareness and engaging what you know Antonio Damasio coined the phrase for, the somatic markers, the subtle body sensations or patterns of tension or preparatory movement that are linked to are underlying maladaptive patterns of thinking and feeling and acting. It's a fancy way to put it. When you become really aware of the subtle somatic qualities in your body, let's say, of shrinking back in a conversation or pulling away from someone who's being a little emotionally intense or maybe pulling away from someone who's bidding for contact, who's trying to you know, draw you closer, including in sweet and wonderful ways, When you're aware of that little body sensation in yourself or the body sensation that comes along with, more globally, a strong sense of self, right? When you become more aware of those uh, underlying somatic markers, you can become a lot freer in relationship to them, less driven by them, and over time, you can even transform them. But if you're not aware of them in the first place, you're numb below the neck. Totally. Um, Completely consistent with my own personal growth experience over time as... I think in much the same way, uh, I was either kind of natured or nurtured, depending, I mean, who knows, into being a pretty cognitively oriented person. Um, And my big journey of self-awareness and personal growth has been largely about connecting with either younger impulses or more body-based impulses. And often those things travel together because we can somatically process before we can cognitively process. So for a lot of people who... Are, are dealing either with issues that happened to them in childhood or they're, um, they have challenges that they struggle to put into words. Uh, somatic interventions can be a wonderful way to approach that. So we spent a good chunk of time discussing what you are exactly, and I'm not sure if we came to an answer, but I like what we talked about, so I feel very <laughs> pleased with that one. But okay, I think that we're about ready to move on to the next one. So next question, I was listening to your conversation on how to make a big decision. And it made me think about my approaching retirement. I've been careful, worried about money, and kind of ground my way through life because I valued security. 
But there are things I would still like to do, including just living day to day without going to work, while I still have the physical ability to do them. I think I probably have enough to safely retire, but releasing the security of a paycheck feels very scary. How do I decide when the time is right? Well, as a longtime therapist, I have found that people often are more willing to talk about the intimate details of their sexuality than they are to acknowledge what their net worth is. As if I care or am going to tell anybody, given that I'm governed by confidentiality. So money actually, and I've even, I don't know what the research actually is, but I've heard it said that money issues are one of the major sources of problems in relationships and couples, uh, even more sometimes than issues related, let's say, to the erotic dimension of their life. Uh, so it's a big deal. I've gone down this road a lot myself. As you know, I have an analytic background with risk analysis and probabilistic ways of thinking about it. And your mom and I have done multiple cycles of when is enough enough. And There's, a, I believe, a saying in um, Taoism that one who knows when enough is enough always has enough. You know, <laughs> or one, <laughs> That's very, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, short version is it's really helpful to do the analysis part and you can do it just on your own um, with an Excel spreadsheet and you can just kind of run it out, A. B, when you run that out, I'll tell you one thing that becomes incredibly clear. Number one, the impact of bad events, big bad events early on. And a lot of what you're doing when you're trying to save for retirement, is to protect yourself against the impact of, you know, those 10% likelihood events, especially during the first five, 10 years or so of your retirement, that wipe you out and have a big, big impact going forward. So I'm not trying to make a person paranoid here. I'm just really trying to inform you about something really important. The largest group living in poverty in America is the elderly. And there are a lot of people who are in a really tough situation. So having thoughtfulness, including when people are young whippersnappers like you, Forrest, uh, it's good to think about this long-term plan as I did not really think about it until late in my 50s. That's kind of as a frame. After you do the analysis, at the end of the day, it's going to boil down to your gut. And the analysis is no replacement for your gut. On the other hand, if your gut is not informed by analysis, Oof, you're rolling the dice and just hoping for the best. And then just the last thing is to make sure you're not erring on either side of having this kind of, you know, scarcity, doom and gloom, skies falling mentality. Or on the other hand, not being foolish about what your life's going to be like, you know, when you're 80 years old. I know a number of people who are really kind of stuck. So find that middle place, you know, where you're, um, like I said, you're not being overly anxious, but on the other hand, you're not being under anxious. Yeah. I think that the big picture question here is how does analysis help us feel better or not help us feel better about an emotional experience? That's kind of the macro level question, because what you see sometimes is that knowing can support us in feeling less anxiety. I've run the math, I've crunched the numbers, I've got my Excel spreadsheet, I know now that I can safely retire. And then sometimes what happens is that we do the analysis, we run the math, we crunch the numbers, and we know that we can safely retire, and there is still a part of the mind that is deeply terrified of retirement for all of the reasons that the questioner got into and for some of the reasons that you alluded to in your answer there, Dad. Um, and I think that there's just a difference between good planning and using planning as an avoidance mechanism. A lot of the time, people get so into all of the things they need before they can do X that they never do X. As a quick kind of framing note on this, there's a lot of research about the intersection of money and happiness. And the findings are really complicated, but the basic takeaway is that money does indeed buy comfort and quality of life. And comfort and quality of life are big components of happiness, right? 
But there are diminishing returns associated with this. And then there's something else, this other metric called life satisfaction. And it is very unclear whether or not money contributes in really meaningful ways to life satisfaction, particularly past a certain quantity of money. There are plenty of people with tons of money, but are pretty clearly profoundly unfulfilled by their lives. And some of them pop up on our televisions occasionally. <laughs> Uh, doing a little social commentary there. In terms of the question itself, I, I think that I'm going to operate under the assumption, which was sort of suggested in the question, that this person has done their homework. They've got the spreadsheet. They've talked to somebody who's got some knowledge of these issues. They're being reasonably cautious. At that point, I think that it really is about managing fear and about attempting to move toward a valuing of new possibility as opposed to getting really contracted around the worst case scenarios. And, and that could be a hard stance to move toward. And it's why we you know, recently did an episode on abundance and scarcity mindsets and things like that. I love your distinction between um, yeah. life satisfaction and other mm -hmm. kinds of well-being. And mm -hmm. um, I think you could well be right about the particular questioner. I will say, from my experience with people in general, most people do not do even a back of the envelope uh, projection related to how much money they're gonna wanna live on uh, when they get older. Uh, they're scared to do it. They think they're, they're math phobic. They think it's overly complicated. They wish they had more money. They're afraid. Uh, very <laughs> few people in my personal experience really bring just a basic lemonade stand level of arithmetic to it. And I strongly encourage you to do this. Yeah, there's there's a huge point implicit in what you're saying there, Dad, that I just want to unpack as like a general principle for people, which is to don't let your fear of a certain kind of process, like discovering that there's a problem, get in the way of you identifying a real problem. And I think that you see this over and over again in so many different verticals, right? Where somebody is afraid that if they like uh, peek underneath the floorboards, they'll discover that there is a bad thing happening. So they just kind of blasely go about their day and then eventually a bad thing does happen, but that bad thing would have been preventable if they had just peek underneath the floorboards. So in a way, we kind of sometimes will these things into existence based on our fear of them, not in a metaphysical way per se, but just in a very practical day-to-day -day kind of way. It's so true. And you're speaking about the general value of um, the truth setting is free and the general principle, yeah, that ignorance drives suffering and having the humility to turn over every darn stone just in case that under the hundredth stone is a bag of gold or, you know, a nasty dragon about to bite your head off. And I think that's just true a lot. You know, you have these conversations with people and you walk away and you think you're clear about what they said and what you've agreed to, but there's that kind of nagging feeling like, huh, there's an ambiguity that remained, a fuzziness. And often it's okay, but maybe that there's that one time in 10 or one time or 20 that whatever's lurking in the fuzz comes back to bite you in the tush. And so I just really think that there's a good, strong general principle here about inquiry and trusting yourself that you can figure things out. You just have to keep banging away at it. If people who are pseudo experts like your accountant or your financial planner say stuff to you that you don't understand or your physicians um, or your lawyers, whatever, or your plumbers, no, 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 no. You know, if you can't explain it to me, in terms that I can understand, you probably don't understand it deeply yourself. It's okay to have that attitude, not obnoxiously, but respectfully, no, help me understand it here. You really can do that. And boy, you think about major, major decisions in life that have huge implications. Uh, one of the major ones is when you decide to you know, stop working or stop drawing a regular paycheck. That has huge financial implications. Uh, it's really important to get that kind of decision right. Yeah, no, totally. And uh, you just led us into the next question beautifully because you're going to be asked to explain a complicated idea very simply here. So here's the question. I like hearing about all of the neuroscience that you talk about on the podcast, but I'm not always sure that I actually understand it. 
For instance, you use the phrase neurons that fire together wire together a lot. What does that actually mean in layman's terms? Okay, and I really will try to regulate myself here. <laughs> so the phrase Sim- itself, short words, simple sentences, all of that stuff. Yes. Okay. Basically, the idea is that what we experience in the moment, what we think and what we feel, involves underlying neural activity. All right? So far, so good? Mm -hmm. At a minimum, what's happening in your mind... Something's going on in your brain while stuff is going on out there. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And maybe there's mysterious capital C consciousness processes woven in the invisible finger of God, don't know. But minimally, there's a correlation between the flow of experiences and the flow of neural activity. Okay, so far, so good. Second, those flows of neural activity can leave lasting traces behind in altered structure or function in the nervous system. The nervous system is designed to be changed by our experiences. Those processes of change involve what's called neuroplasticity, plasticity just being something is changeable, and neuro means the nervous system is changed by our experiences. So how does that change process happen? Including through deliberate effort to change ourselves for the better. Let's say we have Pavlov's dog, and there's the ringing of the bell, And there's the smell of the meat. When the neurons that are involved with the experience of a bell, of hearing a bell ring, are active at the same time that neurons are active that are involved with the experience of smelling the meat and starting to drool, yum, yum, yum. As a result, what happens is that they start to form connections between each other. They start to associate with each other. And that physical process of association, which can include literally physical tendrils, neuronal tendrils, extending to each other and making new synapses, creating new connections. Um, As that process of connecting occurs, there's a process of learning that develops. This is the how of learning, particularly associative learning over time. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think that's super helpful. Yeah, and it's really helpful, I think, for people to think in terms of association. Um, Because there are are two different things that we're kind of talking about here. The first thing is, how does your brain get better at something? Like, if you're learning an instrument, something is happening inside of your brain to give yourself capabilities that you didn't have previously. Some of this is just about motor skills, right? But there are probably some other things going on as well. Um, Then in this other version, what you're describing is things are becoming increasingly strong in their associations with one another over time. And this is part of why kind of traumatic experiences of various kinds are so powerful and so painful for people because two things become negatively associated with each other most of the time. People who have a pathological fear of driving because they got into a previous car accident. Like, well, it's very understandable. They were in a car, a bad thing happened, their brain now goes... Every time I get into a car, a bad thing is going to happen. Now, we know that that's not true objectively, but the brain has learned something really important about the world and is holding on to it really tightly. So that's kind of another way to think about the neurons that fire together, wire together phrase. So I think that that's actually a pretty good segue because our next question is going to focus on traumatic experiences. Uh, including ones that happen in childhood. So if that's tender territory for you, very understandably, feel free to skip this one, and we're going to have one more after this. So here's the question. I was listening to your podcast focused on connecting with your inner child, and I wanted to reach out. I went through some very painful experiences as a child. My mother died when I was very young, which was followed by a lot of emotional abuse from my stepmother and later some problems with my father. Because of this, I have a hard time feeling and thinking about that time. Would the process of connecting with a younger self be similar for me as it would be for someone who didn't have those experiences? Would I need a therapist to guide and support me? And what kind of impact do you think it would have on me? Oh boy, a lot in that. And um, 
first off, I feel for this particular person and and also just to name the number of people, including kids right now, who are dealing with really, really tough conditions, whether it's the one in five American children living below the poverty line or um, kids who are dealing with, you know, chronic violence or alcoholism with their parents in their home. It's really difficult stuff. Uh, Quick question here is, can a person tune into younger parts of themselves? That's kind of what we're talking about broadly. The feeling that there's there's a, a memory or a feeling, maybe going back to when you were in your early adulthood or then your adolescence, maybe even younger, <coughs> even, maybe even all the way to something that feels extremely young. Can you tune into that without being hijacked? by potentially overwhelming and flooding emotional material from, let's say, a traumatic history, including the loss of a, of a parent when you were, you know, really pretty young. That's kind of the question on the table here, how to do that. And it really helps to strengthen general executive functions of mindfulness and regulating your attention, and also to build up the capacity to take refuge in effect inside a feeling of calm strength to take refuge in the sense of others who care about you as a way to be resourced. Going back to the way I answered the question about what kind of therapist am I to be resourced when you're dealing with that kind of issue. And we've explored many of those, those topics. One thing I think is really helpful for people to appreciate is it's really okay to skirt the edges of the volcano. You don't have to dive in to the white hot center of it because of some necessity for your own healing. You can really kind of move around the edges. If there's a particular time in your life that was especially charged, but underneath it all, before everything fell apart, you have the the knowledge that you were actually raised with a fair amount of stability and love. And maybe you just skip over what it was like to be in grade school And you go to your kind of early emotional memories of being yourself up through age five or so, because everything was great before, let's say, your mother died. So you can bypass it. You can jump over that crummy territory. Further, this is really sweet and doable. You can imagine and be be in touch with a kind of innate innocence and purity and childlikeness, not childishness in the negative sense, but childlikeness that is indestructible. It's undamageable. It may be needed to hide <laughs> deep inside you to survive the, the really rotten years, but it truly is intact. And you can have faith in that fact. Uh, it, it's not breakable. It's unbreakable this innermost core of your own being. And you can imagine a kind of pure archetypal, kind of almost universal inner child that has nothing to do with the abuse you suffered in your family or the shocking loss of a beloved parent. It's it's really intact. And you can tap into that and, and get in touch with what that inalienable, indestructible, unbreakable part of you has to offer. Well, I think that's lovely advice for starters. And the whole territory having to do with painful experiences in childhood is, as you were saying, very sensitive and incredibly tender. And I'm not a clinician. So any opinion that I offer here is offered very diffidently. To directly answer the questioner's question, um, I do think that there are probably elements of that process that would be meaningfully different for you than they would be for somebody who did not go through those experiences. For starters, you just have a lot more to process that happened to you. As we were talking there about neurons that fire together, wire together, you have been wired in ways that maybe somebody else has not been. And that sucks, and that is not fair. And it's also not your fault. And I think that sometimes it can be really powerful to get in very close contact with the ways in which it was not your fault. 
And that can be um, quite difficult for people often. Uh, there's a lot of self-blame that can enter the field for people who have gone through abuse experiences that, again, does not make logical sense to somebody who views the situation from the outside, but it's almost a way that the brain can protect itself um, because children seek to make sense of their world and they derive a lot of that sense-making from their primary caregivers. So it's actually safer for kids to feel like they are bad and wrong than for them to feel like their parent is unreliable or unstable. Um, because that actually is a much scarier world because it's a world that fundamentally doesn't make sense. And uh, that for me was like a very powerful piece of information to learn when I first kind of encountered it. And it really helped me reframe how I thought about a lot of different things. Um, so yeah, I would absolutely, if you have the wherewithal to do so, advise working with a clinician around this very, very tender stuff as opposed to taking a pure fix-it-myself kind of uh, attitude. At the same time, there are a lot of really good resources that are available out there. We've uh, talked ourselves on the podcast about complex trauma um, and dealing with various kinds of traumatic experiences may or may not be useful for you, but I would kind of start there. So I think that that's most of uh, what we can do in kind of a summary way for that particular question. Is there anything you'd like to add at the end, Dad? I think you really wrapped it up beautifully there. And you know, the thing that I just keep coming back to is... Don't give up. Don't give up. Whether it's your yeah. retirement planning or working it out with your relatives <laughs> or the question we're going to get to next or whether it's grappling with your own inner, you know, wounding as a child. Don't give up. Hang in there. Even if you're not able to utterly resolve every little bit of it, the journey, the effort is noble itself. It's worth doing itself. Yeah, for sure. Well, with that maybe as a little context for our last question today, here it is. I have a partner that I love very much. We're engaged, and I think he's a fantastic person. He listens to me, he cares about my feelings, and we have a very positive relationship. The issue is that my parents, and through them, a lot of my extended family, seem to really dislike him. They complain about him to me, things that seem really very minor to me, and often correct or criticize him in small ways when he visits. They take offense to every little thing that he does. I love my parents, and I'd like everyone to have a positive relationship, but it's starting to get to my future husband, and I've told my parents many times that I think he's great and that they're overstating things. I don't really know what to do. Oh boy, well, myself, I, I would like to know more, and I suspect the person who wrote that <clears throat> would be benefited by trying to find out a little more exactly what's with their parents and what's that about? Are the parents onto something that she is drawn to someone who everyone but her can recognize as a psychopath? You know, not really, but as a charming narcissist or something like that. Is there anything really there? Or is it that he's from maybe a different culture or background, or ethnicity, mm -hmm, or religion, or something or other uh, than her parents are, and there's basically prejudice on the table that's being disguised as nitpicking this or that. What's really going on here? What's what's the deal? What really is going on? And is there something really, really substantive, or is it honestly just the parents' kind of BS? that nobody's good enough for their daughter, that everybody else in the family system is buying into. So trying to find out what is going on. And then second, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this as someone grounded in American culture, and I grew up in a sort of WASP-like sort of way. So very tight family networks are not my own personal background. And I can respect the fact that whether it's people in America and especially people from around the world, these networks of extended family are much more consequential and meaningful. And I, I can really get that. That said, uh, this person, the guy sounds great. If you're planning on having children with him or not, either way, you go into your marriage thinking that you're gonna spend the rest of your life together, which means most likely you're going to outlive your parents and be with this person you know, long after your parents um, are really playing a major role in your life. And, you know, not to be overly American 
know culturally about it, but I think a lot of people, basically, if they had to make a hard choice between uh, having a you know a fairly polite, civil, once a year visit, distanced relationship with their parents, compared to you know giving up on someone they could they could spend 360 days a year with with wonderful happiness and fulfillment, they would choose spending. Uh, you know, and prioritizing the person who could be their mate. So kind of contextually here. It's also true that I say this as a guy who's approaching his 40th wedding anniversary and um, who was married for a long time while his parents, me, were still alive. Certainly my dad who outlived my mom by about 10 years. Uh, You know, over time, there are natural processes of distancing. you know, kind of civil uh, uh, compartmentalizing of relationships while still feeling love for people in your extended family. And over time, there often are ways to, you know, just kind of politely disengage and stay out of trouble. And and especially when grandchildren come along, wow, you have some major bargaining chips, you know, <laughs> with your own family of origin. What do you think, Forrest? You're you're on the other side of this, you know? Like, what if uh, mom and I, you know, we just hated Elizabeth, uh, who we don't. We really love her and like her a lot. Yeah. Uh, but if you're like always saying, <laughs> Thankfully Forrest, we're... she's so bad yeah. for you. You know, these therapists are crazy. Your kids will be harmed. Totally. Can these you crazy therapists, growing up man. With the I know. We're going to delve oh. into their brain. Oh, Jeez. no. Don't do it, Forrest. Don't do it. I mean, what would you do? I, I think it's really hard for starters yeah. because I, I totally agree with everything you said in terms of about find out what's true. There, you know, we all have our blind spots. And thankfully, I have never brought somebody home where you guys were like, yeah, I don't know about that one. Maybe there were ones where you kept it to yourself. I don't know. That's that's for you to for you to know and for me to find out, maybe. But in general, you never you never took that orientation with a significant other of mine. So I can't speak from personal experience here. Um, but just having seen it among friends or, or kind of thinking about it in terms of general terms, there is definitely a big find out what's true process. There are sometimes things that other people see that we just don't see. And and it's it's appropriate to have a certain um, humility about our own perception, our ability to perceive other people clearly, all of that stuff. I'm going to assume for purposes of this question that the parents and the family system's gripes are about something else. A uh, big functionality question around behavior for starters. Is there a specific behavior your partner is doing that they are finding problematic? And is that behavior easily editable? And if it is, then you can have a wonderful conversation with your partner about, hey, I don't think this is an issue, but my family's a little funky about this. Would you mind scaling it back a little bit? And if they're like, I'm just not going to do that, that's kind of interesting for starters and maybe is something that's worth investigating a little bit, right? That's like, oh, interesting. Hmm. Um, part of the calculus. So that's question number one. Question number two, exactly everything you said, Dad, about cultural differences, prejudice, um, even just like homeostatic disruption. We've talked about this a lot on the podcast in the past when groups are very resistant to change. And people often perceive time as a scarce resource because it is. So if your parents are used to having you over and just getting to spend all of their time with you, and all of a sudden this other person has entered the field that they care about less because it's not their genetic child and is starting to steal your time away from them, wow, that can very easily create some resentment and some frustration and some, oh, why are you spending so much time with John? Don't you know that he's a blah, 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 you know? Because of that underlying threat to the system as a whole. And so that's something that I just want to highlight here, that... Um, sometimes groups, when they get disorganized because something new happens, there's just a lot of kicking up of the dust. And over time, the dust settles as everyone obtains clarity about what the new situation is. So maybe there's the space to have a conversation with your parents around like, hey, are you bothered that I'm spending more time with John than I am with you? And I've created that name for the record. That was not in the questioner's question. Um, or is there something about like the system of interaction that we have with each other that's creating some additional stress for you. And are, are there some ways where we could address that in reasonable ways? So maybe that's a useful conversation. 
I think that's incredibly astute for us. That notion of just disturbing equilibrium generically almost. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to build on something that you you named there and really flag it, which is um, <clears throat> often what happens, let's say, I'll use this example. So let's suppose that her fiance does some things that maybe he's a little sloppy with his table manners or he's a little overly enthusiastic when they're watching football or use a little more deodorant. I don't know. Okay. The, there is something there. And often in relationships, there is something there. So person A has a preference that person B would shift in some way. And it's a fairly small thing, but that point cuts both ways. It's a small thing for person A to bang on about, but it's also a small thing for person B to resist yielding about. So then what happens is that the ask gets put on the table. There's an ask in the space. Person A asks B to stop doing something, let's say. And person B says, hey, it's not a big deal. I don't know why you're bothered by it. And person A says, I know it's true, but given my childhood, given my background, given my genetic vulnerability, quick little sidebar, your mom, literally, genetically, she has a gene that's one of those genes that makes people particularly sensitive to and annoyed by the sound of other people eating. Okay, so she can't help it. She can't help it. Now, I'm raised by my mother to always, you know, be very super polite with table manners and so forth. I'm, I'm pretty normal. I'm pretty okay. But literally, just for example, eating potato chips with your mouth closed, but within six feet of her is irksome. Okay. Then there's your sister, who, as we know, cannot stand the smell of mayonnaise or bananas, among other things. So person... B is asking person A, let's say, something or other, uh, or vice versa, and the ask is on the table. Then the real question becomes, what does the other person do with the ask apart from the merits of what is being asked for? If it's a fairly small thing, is the other person willing to respond to your wants and your wishes and how you're feeling about something or other. So in this example here, it may well be that the parents, you know, if you really stretch it, there is something kind of, sort of, about the fiancé that might, you know, maybe bother a reasonable person. That said, maybe the questioner's in a position to say, look, mom and dad, I love this guy. He's a catch. There are not that many catches around. I love this guy. I get what your deal is. It doesn't bother me. I understand that you're bothered by it. But for me, for me, for the sake of your daughter's happiness, for the sake of your long-term relationship with someone who could be the father of, of her children, I think she's female. I can't quite tell from the example. Let's assume that for the moment. Uh, could you just let this go? Could you work internally yourselves to manage it minimally, even if it still bothers you internally, outwardly? Can you be polite? Can you be supportive? You know, can you also recognize some of the many, many wonderful things about this guy and let him know that you see those things about him rather than fixating on the one little tiny mosaic or the one little tiny tile in the overall mosaic of who this guy is that's flashing red for you? Please. For me, could you do that? That's the ask. And then it gets really interesting. What do people do with the ask? Because how they respond to the ask is actually now the big issue. It's no longer about the fact that he chews with his mouth open once in a while, but let's say, or he puts barbecue sauce on ice cream. I have no idea. Uh, you know. <laughs> well, that's a punishable offense, Dad. That's, 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 okay, that's too far. That. Get You've get crossed the line. You cross the line, okay? No barbecue sauce, <laughs> on, but but chocolate ice cream would be okay, just not vanilla. Anyway, uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so yeah, that, yeah, yeah, so that's kind of the deal, and that kind of leads me in general to try to be responsive to the asks of other people, if you possibly can. Yeah, I love it. I think that's a great uh, framework and a great kind of final idea to leave people with here. So. 
we worked our way through six different questions. I'm very proud of us. I'm particularly proud of the people who sent in the questions. For starters, because sending in a question to be answered on a podcast is itself a little spooky, I would imagine. Um, and also, I just really appreciate how interested and invested people are in both the material that we talk about in the show and more broadly in becoming a more whole more happy, more healthy person out in the world. I just think that it's so great that we have an opportunity to, to talk about this kind of stuff and that people are so interested in it. So again, thank you so much for sending in your questions. You can reach us at contact at beingwellpodcast.com or through social media. And you can find links to all of that in the description of the show, which you should be able to find through whatever podcast player you're currently listening on. So today I had a great time talking with Rick about all of these wonderful questions that people sent in. We began today's conversation with a question focused on when to time challenging conversations with other people. Uh, there's often this tendency that can emerge inside of our relationships where when things are, are kind of bad with somebody else, maybe we don't want to toss a really difficult communication onto the pile because they're already sort of going through a hard time. And at the same time, when things are really good and really easy, we also don't want to make a challenging communication because we don't want to mess up a good thing. And that's really tough. You can create a situation where you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. In this particular situation, the questioner was asking about making a difficult communication or asking to process some things with their family. And there's a lot of extra tension and stress right now, of course, due to COVID, people are seeing each other less frequently. It just doesn't feel like the right time. And just as they're insinuating, there are definitely better and worse times to make an important communication. As a kind of classic example, having a big process conversation while you're driving a car is generally not a great idea. Your attention's distracted, it's a little extra stressful, it's just not laying the foundation for things to go well. So maybe there's an opportunity here for the questioner to lay the foundation with their own family to have a talk about talking, to kind of set the ground rules as to whether or not this is a conversation that they would be comfortable engaging. And if it's not, well, then it's time to start asking what can you do inside of your own experience that can make things as good as possible. And alongside that, have you just hit the end of your rope? Is there nothing else that you can do for yourself? And it really is time to engage this difficult question with the broader family system. In the second question, Rick was asked what kind of a therapist he is. And the truth is that Rick's a generalist. He's been trained in a lot of different methodologies and he really takes a pretty holistic approach to therapy. He's the kind of guy who believes that you need to have a tool in your toolbox for everything because different things are gonna work well or poorly for different people. The third question focused on when a person can know that it's time to retire. But the underlying question really had to do with this balance of safety and security with taking a big swing and chancing a risk and doing what you really want to do and uh, to steal the line that Rick likes to quote all the time, your one wild and precious life. And analysis can really inform our intuition here. It's really important to go through a thorough process of evaluating what the facts of the situation are, because once you do, you can make a much more informed decision. But there are times where we've truly gone through the whole analysis and still we're afraid to take the next step. And then it becomes about processing the psychological fear that is arising due to this new circumstance that's evolving inside of your life. There are a lot of ways to do that, a lot of different approaches that might work for different people. And we've certainly explored a variety of ways to cope with anxiety on previous episodes of the podcast. The fourth question had to do with the phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. And Rick was asked to simply explain what that phrase meant. The basic idea to really oversimplify complex territory is that different kinds of experiences become associated with one another. It's like Pavlov's bell, right? The dog hears the bell and knows that that means they're getting fed. So over time, the ringing of the bell becomes associated with the dog getting a nice juicy steak. And your brain starts to plan accordingly. Every time it hears that bell, saliva starts getting produced by your mouth. And you wouldn't think that hearing and salivating would normally be associated with each other. 
but it becomes a learned association over time. There was then a very tender question that related to how we can connect with our inner child when our inner child went through some real painful experiences in life. And there is no simple answer to this question. It is a incredibly deep and rich and complex one. I largely emphasized the importance of not internalizing abuse. It's a very, very common pattern that you see in uh, early abuse situations where the child comes to believe that they are the problem and that it's actually not the caregiver's fault. Rick, on the other hand, emphasized a couple of useful practices. The first one is that you can think of your childhood in a general or holistic way. What were the broad traits that you had? What were the general things that were really valuable to you without getting into the specifics of it? And in much the same way, if you had a pretty functional childhood up until age five and then a lot of stuff went sideways, you can really try to tune in to the way you were when you were a three-year-old or a four-year-old before those challenging circumstances got introduced. Then finally, we talked about uh, navigating family dynamics when a new person enters the system. In this particular question, it was a future husband that was really kind of taking the stick from the future in-laws. And we emphasized two different things. First, the importance of fact-finding. Maybe there really is something that other people are seeing that you're just not conscious of. And it can be helpful sometimes to have a little bit of humility about uh, our ability to perceive ourselves and the people around us perfectly objectively. None of us can do that, so sometimes getting a second opinion is valuable. But assuming that these complaints are really largely without merit, then you get into why the complaints are happening. What's the source of the complaints? And you can really go through a pretty uh, investigative process around this where you try to determine what's really true. So if you enjoyed this episode and you would like to listen to future mailbag episodes on the podcast, send us a question. It's contact at beingwellpodcast.com. Or you can, of course, leave a question for us to answer through our various social accounts. If you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to it. If you're listening right now and you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. It really does help us out. And also you can join us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. So until next time, thanks so much for listening and I'll talk with you soon.